Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm Jenny Mutley Collins and I'll be moderating today's session along with my colleagues Stuart Vinney, Ellie Benstead and Jenny Turnbull. During the webinar you'll be able to hear our speaker Claire Medwell and to see her slides but you won't actually be able to see Claire herself. You won't need a microphone if you want to ask a question, please use the questions box, which you should be able to see in your control panel on the right of your screen. So click on the small arrow to the left of the word questions in order to write and view questions. You can make this box larger by clicking on the small box with an arrow to the top right of the questions box. The recording of today's webinar will be on our blog and on YouTube next week. We will also email you a copy of your attendance certificate the week after the webinar. So I'm very pleased to welcome Claire as, the, as this morning's presenter, this morning here in the UK. <laughs> Passionate about quality English teaching, Claire Medwell is a teacher, teacher trainer and independent materials writer. She has 26 years of experience in ELT and ESL, specialising in infant and primary learners. Her publications include Cambridge Global English, stages four to six, and the new fun skills, levels one and two. So, over to you, Claire. Okay, Jenny, thank you very much for that introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today on this session about using visual literacy in the young learners classroom. Before I start the, um, the slideshow, um, I'm going to try and make this session as interactive with you all as possible. Um, and we'll be demonstrating a uh, few activities which I'd like you to take part in as well. So um, you'll notice that you have a question box. And if I ask you to perhaps put in a write in an opinion or um, give some examples of how you use images in the classroom. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you could just type them into that box, okay, that would be absolutely great. Also during the session, if you've got a little bit of piece, a piece of paper alongside you, maybe it could just be from a notepad, that might also be helpful and a pen and a pencil too. Okay, I hope that's all clear. And uh, let's start today's session. So um, we're going to look at um, how we use and how we teach visual literacy in the young learners classroom. So today this session is called Picture Perfect and how we can bring the young learner classroom to life. So before we uh, move on with looking at how we can teach visual literacy in the classroom, I think perhaps we need to establish and think about what uh, visual literacy means to us as teachers. Now, before I ask you to um, give me your opinion, um, perhaps if we were to separate these two words, um, it might it might sort of help orientate us better. Obviously, if we if we look at visual, that's pretty straightforward because obviously visual would relate to things that we see, and literacy might evoke an image in your mind of perhaps a, a library full of old dusty books or a desk, a pen, exams even. Given that the term literacy, we usually attribute to reading and writing. And this is the way ourselves and the children we teach have traditionally been taught as a means through which we can share our knowledge, our thoughts and our ideas. But if we combine these two, visual and literacy, what do they mean? So what I'd like you to do is in the, if you're in, your, in the question box, could you just tell me what visual literacy means to you as a teacher and what you understand by that? Okay, so just have, a, have about 30 seconds or so uh, if you'd like to write some of your opinions in the box. So what is visual literacy?
Okay, so if people who are just joining again, I'm just going to repeat the question because I know I can see that people are still joining. So just ask the, the people who are attending what they understand by visual literacy, what they think that means. And here we've already got some, some ideas coming in from, from teachers from around the world. So we've got using pictures in order to teach students to read and write. Absolutely. The ability to read images from Floriana. Yes, a lovely um, definition there. Using the pictures to communicate. Ability to process visual information. Oh, some beautiful definitions here. Um, we have another one here from Arturo. The visual literacy is the ability to interpret, negotiate and make meaning from information. We have uh, Abdullah, it might mean realia, real things. Wow, wonderful. For me as a teacher, it means the ability to read visual presentations from Leia. Lovely. Whoa, we've got lots of, so we've got lots of definitions here. And in fact, what you're all defining is actually the same, same thing, but in, in using slightly different words. Uh, we have another one here. It means, the, means um, being able to read visual images. So understanding them perhaps. Lots of really lovely definitions. So if you have a look at the one I've suggested, um, is that visual literacy is our understanding of all kinds of images, pictures, and symbols in our everyday life. Uh, you can see uh, there's a few little photos that I've pasted around this definition, which are perhaps um, uh, very modern day, modern up-to-date images that, that we're all exposed to on a daily basis and children as well. So the question today is that visual literacy, so our ability to see, understand, think, create and communicate graphically, how is that changing in the 21st century? Well, this is labelled, certainly in ELT, or we're labelling now visual literacy as a 21st century skill. And the importance of being visually literate in our media-driven world in which we're constantly, not, uh, not just the children we're teaching, but ourselves as well, bombarded with images from video games to online advertising, emoticons, emojis, memes, all of these images require, I would say, a new level of understanding. So we're going to be looking today at how we can help the children in our English classes develop this new level of understanding to be able to interpret and understand these pictures and images they're looking at every day. If we look at the ones we have on the screen now, the first one you might see as that would be a beautiful one to write a uh, meme, perhaps. Um, so we've got the dog looking at the cat. Um, we could even use these in class now. So you could pick up something like this and you could ask the children what the dog's perhaps saying to the cat or what the cat thinks of the dog. So we have these um, lovely images now that children are used to seeing where they could even write a dialogue to accompany this image. The, the image of the video game, I'm sure you recognize this as a very popular video game. Um, many of the children uh, we teach will be playing this, no doubt. And also, it also reflects the type of films they might be seeing at the cinema or at home as well. These kind of new imagery which children enjoy working with. Um, I know my son, he still plays this game and I've yet to understand some of these incredible constructions he makes in this game. Um, and then obviously we have the emojis and the emoticons. Um, to be honest, I'm still trying to figure out many of them. I'm not sure about yourself and I tend to just use a few that I'm sure about. Um, so even we have a lot to learn about this new type of visual literacy um, that we're working with. So today we're going to look at how we can teach key life competences, competences through the development of visual literacy skills. But before we actually go forward, I'd like to um, go back. So as a human race, we've always communicated visually. It's not that today, um, today's media-driven world is anything new. It's just another version of perhaps what we've always done. Um, so even before humankind developed language, 
Stories and traditions were passed down the generations through paintings, symbols and images, many like, like many of the ones we have on the screen. So we've got the Paleolithic cave paintings in Lascaux, France. There's Altamira in Spain. And then, of course, there's the Egyptian hieroglyphics. So, so really, we're going back to basics in many ways. Now we have modern hieroglyphs that are called, um, as you all know, emoticons. Um, and obviously they've been developed um, as they're a fast and effective way of conveying an emotional message. And they were developed because it was felt in our, in our world, which is, which is fast moving, that these, these more quickly and effectively um, transmit a message more so than the written word. So it's very important that we understand how to interpret these in question, uh, correctly and the children we teach as well. So this takes us to the impact of image on our memory. And we're going to look at a few statistics about the impact of image. Oh, now I haven't made an error there. This is actually part of the presentation. Did you all just see the text that flashed up on the screen? Well, I'm gonna quickly flick back once more and I'm going to flick off again, but look carefully at the text on the screen. Here we go. And off. Okay, this is a little experiment, um, which you could also do with your children in your class, but I'd like you to write in the question box again, any words that you can remember from that text that I just flashed up on the screen, okay? So just to write down any words, even if it, or even a sentence, if you have a very good memory, that you, you saw in that text that just flashed up. So if you start writing your answers in the question box now. Oh, straight away, we've got Arctic, the Arctic, lower, hotter than, Arctic hotter before. We have a whole sentence here from Eleanor. The Arctic is hotter now than ever before. She, Eleanor has a very, very good memory. Um, Patrick, someone's asking if this is the question box, and my answer to that is yes. Um, Arctic, Arctic, hotter than. So generally, you've all you've all picked up on the same words, and generally it's from the beginning of the text. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you this text, which is from one of the fun skills books, but with image. Okay, so you have your look, if you have a look at this screen, you can see the text which I took was from the one on the right about the polar bears and the environment. And you obviously picked up if you have a look, because we naturally start to read a text, the Arctic is hotter now than it was before. Um, I'm not sure, I can't remember whether anyone mentioned polar bears, um, but obviously with children, uh, it's certainly at primary, primary level, we've always supported text uh, with image. But I think this shows how important image is to, to our brains and to our memories. If we just look at the images around it, we have a polar bear, we can see plastic, we can see ships, we can see a polar bear's teeth, we can see where the, the Arctic is on the map as well, and also their diet of seals and small whales. So. This is why we usually back up um, text with image at primary level and as a means of them uh, predicting the content from images. So let's, let's move on a little bit at some statistics about why we use visual information with text. Um, well, studies show that we retain only 10 to 20% of written or spoken information. Um, which I think from our little experiment we did by just looking at text, um, this is quite relevant. Um, but when we actually pair a text with images, 65% of the information is retained. And in fact, studies show that that 65% of um, the text pair with the, the information in the text, which is in our short-term memory, is far easily transferred to our long-term memory when it's paired with text. And also visual information is processed extremely quickly by, our, by the brain. In fact, it's something like 
and our brain can register and process an image in something like 13 milliseconds. So that's really fast. And then finally, just to back up the importance of this visual information and imagery and how we understand it, 90% of the information transmitted to the brain is visual in nature. And I think if we just look at adults and our everyday life, that's pretty, um, well, pretty easily, easily understandable, I think, that 90% of the information is visual in nature. So let's move on. So now we've looked at the, the actual, the reasons for using imagery, we're going to look at how we might use imagery in a slightly different way in the classroom. So have you heard of this, this proverb, a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, this is believed to be an ancient Chinese proverb and probably couldn't be more valid in our modern day society. We, we see lots of pictures trying to transmit us all kinds of words and all kinds of kind of advertising at the same time. But also many pictures are open to interpretations depending how, how we view it. In a day of age when we, we're faced with fake news, hoaxes, many of the photos and pictures we see aren't real, um, this, this is mainstream. And our ability and the children's ability to interpret and decode these images correctly is ever more essential for their development. So for example, if you were to show this picture to your students, what kind of questions might, might you ask them? I'm going to throw a few questions out to you while you write yours into the question box. So have a think. Imagine you show these photos to your class and you want them to compare them. So the first obvious question would be to interpret it. So what can you see? in these two photos. You might say, what are the people doing in these two photos? Now, how could we delve deeper into, those into these photos? Have any of you thought of any more questions? I'm going to flick up the question box now to see if we've got any questions coming up. Oh, that's a good one. We might have, what is going to happen next? Yes, perhaps the one in the selfie would be a very appropriate. Um, any other questions? Whoa, we've got lots of questions here. How do the people feel? Yes, how do the people feel? We have an example of kind of like 1930s New York in the left-hand side photo. So it may be that, well, I certainly wouldn't be very happy working at that height with no safety equipment, um, but this was obviously their job. There wasn't any safety equipment at that time and they're building the skyscrapers in New York. Um, perhaps the person in the right-hand side taking his selfie, is feeling exhilarated or is quite worried about whether he might fall. Can you guess which city it is? Yes, Poonam, excellent question. The changes that have taken place, another one. We have a question from Linda. How did the two men get up there? Lovely. Uh, from Lila, we have one. What, what is the man going to post on his picture caption? Similarities, find similarities, yes. Yes, a good question. Why is the man standing on the fence? And I think this is obviously a question that we do need to talk and actually quite seriously to children about the danger of taking selfies in these kind of places and why some people feel the need to do this. Lovely questions. Thank you, everyone, for posting all these. Um, really nice. OK, so so it's delving deeper into a picture and talking about perhaps some very important also we've got to think about perhaps the, this in fact if you think about these two photos there's almost a century that separates them so i think from this as well we can say that human beings humankind we've always liked to be in high places but perhaps in the right hand picture not in quite a silly fashion or <laughs> we may say even stupid seeing as people could be risking their lives um, to take these kind of selfies okay so a picture is worth a thousand words but what about an icon? So we're going to do another experiment. Here we've got an icon is worth a thousand words. We're going to do an activity now with emoticons and emojis. I'm not sure whether you use these in your class now, um, but they're also a very fun way of children um, inventing their own message using uh, emoticons or emojis. So we're going to do a little experiment. This is a real experiment that took place and the person who was sending the message 
used these icons. So we had the thumbs up, we had the moon, we had the sleeping emoticon, and we had the A-OK -okay, perfect. Okay, so my question to you is what message do you think was intended with these icons? So have a little think and get writing again in the question box and let's see if we come up with um, the same message or variations on the same message or perhaps a completely different message. Okay, let's see if people are putting some of their, oh yeah, well yes, good night. That would be a very good one. Uh, we have another one, tonight I'm going to sleep earlier. Yeah, mm-hmm. Ah, Linda has a good one here. A good night's sleep makes you feel better. Poria, we have it's time to go to bed. Okay. Ah, Jennifer has said, Mum says we can have a sleepover. And Patrick, we have one. A good night's sleep makes you ready for the day. Ah, and Poonam has good night sleep well. Should we have a look at what the question actually was? Because I think someone's got it. So the question was, good night, sleep well. And I think it was Poonam, was it? But guess that correctly. However, we're now going to look at people from different countries, different cultures, who had slightly different interpretations of this, which was very similar to yours. So I think this was the someone from Germany who interpreted this as free this evening for a sleepover. And I think sleepover was also mentioned in, in your questions, uh, your answers to this. And then the last one was, to be out all night is great, but sleeping is better. Now that's quite an imaginative interpretation on that one. So again, the idea that images can be interpreted in all kinds of different ways which has a good side to it, but also perhaps a bad side, which we'll be looking at shortly. Okay, so let's move on to the next. So let's think about now our classrooms and what kind of visual imagery we use regularly in our young learner classroom. I have put up on the screen kind of a word snake, which I kind of like you to continue if we just can like go through together and break up these words. So we have flashcards photographs, storybooks, apps, mind maps, graphs, slideshows, posters, videos, and art. So can you add to that list? Can you have a think about what other kind of visuals you use in your primary class? So if you can write your answers again in the question box, I'm sure you have lots more ideas than I have. Let's see. Children's drawings, lovely. Real materials, doodling, charts, paintings. Okay, so some lovely ideas here to add to the types of things we use in the Young Learner Classroom. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we use, how do we usually use um, this visual imagery in class. So what do, for example, do we use flash flashcards for? If we're looking at like the very basic, usually flashcards were used to teach vocabulary, for example. A photograph perhaps we'll use as perhaps practice for one of the young learners tests. So it'd be talking about a photograph, what they think they can see in the photograph, um, what they think people are doing in the photograph. So yes, it's sort of a little bit more in depth with photographs. Uh, storybooks, we might be looking at whole sentences, Again, teaching vocabulary, um, apps. Again, this might be to reinforce the topics and the vocabulary we're learning. Mind maps, this might be used for brainstorming. We may use graphs to chart the results of a survey in the class, for example. Okay, so yes, we use this all in terms of language because we, we are language teachers. Um, so, but what we're going to look at now is how we can go deeper here and we can actually teach life competences through visual imagery. So let's have a look at how we might do this. What do I mean by 
life competencies. So what I mean by this is the ability to interpret a visual, the ability to recognize an image or some kind of visual, the ability to appreciate it, the ability to understand it, the ability to evaluate it, and the, the, the ability to create something, which in this sense is more personal. So we're going to have a look at some examples from, from Fun Skills about how we might do this. But we're going to begin with a drawing dictation. So I'm going to ask you now, if you have a little a piece of paper alongside you and a pen or a pencil, I'm going to dictate something of an image, which I'd like you to try and just quickly sketch. This is something I've done with, with my class as well and something you could easily do with your primary learners. So if we're ready, are you ready? I'm going to dictate the picture I'm looking at to you. So the first thing I'm going to tell you, it's a bedroom. OK, and on the right hand side of the bedroom, there's a bed. OK, so if you quickly sketch your bed. On the bed, there are two cushions. Now, there's a wall next to the bed. So on this wall over the bed, there are four pictures hanging on the wall. Now above the bed, so if we're thinking about the headboard above the bed, there is another painting hanging on the wall. And below the painting, there's a kind of like a um, three jackets hanging on hooks. I hope I'm not going too fast. <laughs> and remember, it doesn't have to be a work of art. So, and next to the bed, there's a chair, a wooden chair. Above the chair, there's a window. It's an old window, wooden, with green frames. And under the window, there's a small wooden table. Above the table, there's a mirror hanging on the wall. And there's another chair, a very similar wooden chair, opposite the bed, next to the table. OK, so that's the end of the drawing dictation. Um, so I've described you a bedroom. Now, this particular bedroom is a very famous bedroom. And it's a famous work of art. So what could this famous work of art be? So if you have a look, the picture of this famous work of art is at the top of the page, the first page in the right hand corner. So do you all recognize this famous work of art? Could you write the name of the artist or the name of the painting itself in the question box? So can we name this artist? Chan, chan. Oh, absolutely. everyone knows this artist. Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh, Van Gogh. Absolutely right. This is Van Gogh, and this is Van Gogh, the bedroom which he painted while he was in France. Um, so this is one way about how you might use a work of art to allow the children to create. So in fact, they're creating um, this work of art before they in fact see it. So then they can perhaps compare it to their own. OK, in the actual activity in the book asks the children to um, look at the painting for a minute and then close their book and then think of all the things they can remember. So this would be a way of interpreting the work of art by naming the different furniture they can see in the painting. OK, so how could we go a little bit deeper with this painting? How could we encourage the children, for example, to recognise it? I asked you to recognize it. You may I say to the children, have you seen this picture before? Is it a painting? Do you think it's famous? Or who do you think the bedroom belongs to? What does he or she look like? How old is he or she? 
if we're looking at asking the children to appreciate the, appreciate this work of art, we may ask them, do you like this painting? Ask for their opinion. What do you think about the colours of the bedroom? And perhaps why do you think the painter decided to paint it? Understanding it, do you think the bedroom is old? Do you think it's modern? Why do you think that? Are there any clues in the picture? Then we could ask the children to evaluate it. We might ask them, would you like a bedroom like this? Or would you change anything in the bedroom? Or perhaps even, what do you have in your bedroom which is not in this picture? So all these ways are encouraging the children to delve much deeper into this image and to get a lot more out of it. And at the same time, we're teaching, us, teaching them all these life competences. So for example, if you remember perhaps your first trip to a art gallery, or if you've been in an art gallery where there's lots of young children, you'll often notice they're distracted and perhaps not looking at the work of art because they may find it, oh, this is boring. Um, but if we give them the tools to actually understand, recognize and appreciate these works of art, perhaps we'll manage to establish, get more interest in the children once they understand what they're looking at. So how could we take this a little bit further? Let's have a look. Well, perhaps we could ask the children, let's just flick through, we could get them to make an origami house. So this is in fact, if I just flick back, flick forward one more time, this is in fact, if we have a look here, the bedroom. And if you have a look, the green windows are in this house that's circled, which is where Van Gogh stayed, stayed in Arles in the south, southern France for a time. So this was actually the house and we could encourage children or give the say to them, well, why don't we make an origami house? Now, it's a shame we can't each see each other right now or, or we could have video and I'd show you how to make this origami house. But it, in fact, it's very, very simple to do with, with um, young learners. Um, I'm just going to explain it to you now. You can make this origami house with a rectangular piece of A4 paper or you can even make it with a square piece of origami paper. Um, and all you have to do is, first of all, is just to fold it in half. As with any origami, the lines have to be very clear. They need to be very straight. So just fold the piece of paper in half. And then to make these triangular roofs, you just need to push up, open up and push to the top and press down your triangle and then just repeat with the other side. If you have a little practice, it doesn't take long to to manage it and if not you could always look at this being done online as there's lots of tutorials you can look at and then obviously we have the option to open up the house itself where the children could draw their bedrooms in the house or other parts of the house so again creating something that's a work of art for them and personalizing it okay so that was van gogh's house so if we have a look now at the characters in the book, now most young learners books will have a character, but I think this particular young learners book, Fun Skills, has very special characters. And there's a reason for this. Um, kids are very, the children are very much at the heart of this course. Uh, so much so that children were asked to think about what characters they'd like to see in the book. So before even we began, the authors began writing this book, there was a competition to ask children to draw the characters they'd like to see. And if you look at the bottom, these were their sketches and these were the winners. So we had children from all over the world drawing their sketches of characters they'd like to see in the book. So we got um, entries from Spain, from Greece, from Brazil, from Turkey, from all over the world. And what then happened was professional artists kind of polished up their drawings and brought their characters to life. So again, we're handing over the controls to the children to create something which is then theirs. OK, so then in the book, how we use, for example, image is something like this. If we've designed the character, why don't we take this a bit further? And why don't you create an, ad, an outfit for your favourite character? So again, handing it over to the children, making their own decisions about the images they see. So, for example, they could design an outfit for a trip to the beach or for a birthday party or even to go to the moon or carnival, for example, if you celebrate carnival in your country. OK, 
So let's have a look at another example of how we might use images in a slightly different way. Okay. We're looking at modern day imagery. So we've been looking at things we're, like such as emoticons, we're looking at memes, um, and how we might exploit them in the classroom. But also I think there's a need for us to connect a lot more to the digital world. Um, now I'm not a digital native, and I imagine most of you listening aren't either, but we're dealing with a lot of children who are digital natives, and they've only ever known a digital world. So their um, expectations of images are very, very high. They're used to dealing with um, very multi-sensual sensual video games, and, and they're used to dealing with images all the time. So I think we have a challenge now in the classroom to try and draw on this visual stimulus and to make up the, the, some of the digital stuff we use kind of more attractive and age appropriate. So here's an example. So for example, instead of perhaps having a, a usual picture of a farmyard, uh, we've taken, for example, the kind of idea of popular video games and films that children might watch um, to use this on a page. So here we've got an example of a farm. Now, if you were to use this image in your classroom, how might you potentialize, how might, how might you maximize the potential of this image in your classroom? So have a little think, and in the questions box, can you think how you might, what you might ask the children to do with this image? What else could you do with it? Try and um, let's see if we can put some of your ideas into the question box and we'll share some. So obviously there's a picture of a farm. What else could we do with this image? Draw the surroundings, yes. Okay. Some more ideas. So where is it? Yes, obviously it's on a pipe. What happens on the farm? Yeah. Name the animals you can see. <laughs> What kind of animal do you see? Make a story. Speech bubbles from the children to the animals. Ah, you could even kind of do a where's the black cat, a kind of where's Wally type type activity. That's lovely for you there. How many animals can see? Can you see? How many of each animal? Lovely. Really nice ideas. What colours are they? What do the animals eat? So you could even take this further in time of, into a kind of a clear activity and perhaps talk about what the animals eat, uh, their characteristics. Like we've got another one here, what actions they can do, what sounds they make. Really nice ideas. Thank you everyone for contributing to that. Okay, also perhaps you could say, you can see there are uh, characters on the farm. And we could ask the children to say, draw yourself on this farm. So they could draw their own kind of cuboid character. They could add animals. We could ask them what other animals live on a farm and can you draw any more, for example. So again, just like tapping in to their world of visual imagery. Um, and I think it's more and more important that we try to do this because I, I don't think we're tapping in, into it enough. And often I think we're a bit scared because also if we think of things like video games, a lot of the video games get a lot of bad press um, and, and obviously rightly so because many of them are quite addictive. But there are games out there that are, in fact, um, very imaginative. It really connects with the imagination of the children. And there are, I think there are things we can take from that to and use them as an English teaching tool. Okay, so let's have a look at another idea. So, for example, children play on games. So they, they, they could decide their own character. So here's kind of like a, uh, a guide for the children to draw their own. So if you have a look, we've got start here. What, who is your character and draw your picture? They think of the name of their character. Um, what does your character wear? And number four, we've got what can your character do? So it could be kind of like, does it have superpowers? Can they fly? Can it climb like Spider-Man? Um, then you could have where does your where does your part where does it live? You could draw your character's home. Perhaps it could be another one in the style of this kind of cubic cuboid style. Um, so again, just like tapping into their imagination a lot more. Okay, so let's move on to graphs and mind maps and image bubbles. So my question to you now is, do you use graphs? Uh, do you use mind maps? And do you use things like image bubbles a lot in your classroom? 
can you tell me what you what you use them for if you use them could you write your answers in the question box again what would you use um graphs mind maps and these kind of things that you can see on the screen for let's have a look at some of your ideas to collect ideas so yes a mind map is a lovely way and kind of if to use image to kind of collect ideas to put them into a logical format for vocabulary absolutely hamid graphs for comparing objects punam that's really nice for teaching lexis madi lovely they usually use for comparisons pura that's really nice class surveys jennifer yes we use them a lot to sort of uh, see how many people for example, have their favorite animal as a cat or how many people um, play basketball in the class compared to how many like swimming, to brainstorm, to warm up, mainly for vocabulary. Yes, some really nice ideas. So yes, absolutely. But do we, do we often reflect on perhaps the importance of these, not, not just for um, on a vocabulary, um, as a means of accessing their knowledge of vocabulary, which is obviously perfectly valid to see what they know and perhaps what they don't know. Um, but also the fact that um, image is, is so important for children, um, most of the children in our class. Um, we need to remember that um, Image, using images in the class makes it very inclusive because everyone can give their opinion. It doesn't really matter the level of English you have. Um, it caters for diversity in the classroom. Um, also that approximately 60%, 65% of learners are visual. And even when we're reading just a text without images, um, as learners, this is not just children, but adults as well, we tend to visualize what we are reading to get a better understanding of the text. Another very, very important point is that children who are dyslexic or who are, who are on the autistic spectrum, for the example, have very strong visual skills and learn better through visual means. So using things like graphs, surveys, mind maps really helps these children to put information into context. So it means that by using these kind, these kind of strategies and these kind of visuals, we're allowing children to make connections between perhaps different pieces of, in, pieces of information which might otherwise have been lost. So just to bear this all in mind uh, when we're using imagery in the classroom. Okay, so today's session we were looking at um, how we use visual imagery, what visual imagery you use, um, the new imagery we're exposed to and bombarded with constantly and looking at how we can teach life competences, these visual literacy skills in the classroom to make the children more prepared for what um, they see in their everyday life. Uh, so we really are preparing kind of like the whole child here rather than not just in an English sense. Um, now, why do we need to do this? Um, I think it's something we need to analyze and assess more and more. I think this, for me, it's just kind of like the beginning of it as well, but, but we need children to be able to view images and to know when something is fake. We need to look, allow these children and sort of to improve their skills at being able to view an image which might be in some way threatening for them to be able to recognize this, for them to know when an image is inappropriate for them to know when an image they're looking at might be offensive to others um, and to provide them with the tools to recognize all this, to know when perhaps they might be being manipulated. It's all these kind of skills that we need to prepare them with through using visual imagery in the classroom. So I think there's a lot of kind of, I hope there's a lot of kind of food, perhaps food for thought here. Um, so let's just have a look at the very last screen. So it's kind of this evolution of visual literacy in the young learners classroom. And I hope that you've found kind of some, some kind of food for thought here through the session um, on how we're using it. So we, this really is a rapidly evolving high tech world and how we use images and visuals in the classroom. So I've come to the end of the session today. Um, 
I hope you found it useful. I hope you found something that we can possibly reflect on, perhaps even some classroom activities you can take away with you. Um, thank you all so much for attending. I'm going to hand you back to Jenny now, who's um, going to have a little chat with you all. And then uh, we're going to do a little bit of a question and an answer session. So whilst Jenny's talking, if you'd like to type any questions in the question and answer box for me, I'll then answer them once Jenny's finished. OK, so thank you all very much. And I'll hand you back to Jenny. Thank you, everyone. Well, many thanks for such an interesting session, Claire. Um, there were some really great ideas there, and I hope the audience has managed to find um, lots of takeaways to take back to their classrooms. Um, as mentioned earlier, we will send you your attendance certificate by email next week, as well as a link to a recording of this webinar. Now, as Claire has said, we're going to have some questions in a minute. So please start typing your questions in the questions box and we'll answer as many as we can in a moment. And while you're having a think about that, um, let me just give you a little bit of information about some of the materials and resources that we have available to support teachers of young learners. Now, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, and as Claire has mentioned herself, um, Claire is one of our authors on a new six level series called Fun Skills, which you can see there. Um, Fun Skills provides fun preparation for pre A1 starters, A1 movers and A2 flyers, and it covers all the skills that you need to be ready on exam day. Fun Skills is a paired book approach. There are two books for each exam level. It's a short course designed to supplement another course book or be used in short exam preparation classes or summer schools, etc. It doesn't present language. This is what would be covered in a main English course that the children are using. But Fun Skills practices language through skills based tasks helping students to communicate confidently through listening, speaking, reading and writing. All of the characters that you can see there in the covers were designed by real students from around the world. They bring the learning to life and they make the skills fun. Um, fun Skills has topic led units with a strong skills focus to ensure that all of the four skills are thoroughly covered. There are grammar fun sections, skills checklists to build confidence and video animations, bringing the characters and language to life. Mini trainers for pre A1 starters, A1 movers and A2 flyers provide two full colour practice tests with training and exam practice. And a home booklet provides extra skills practice. There are fun boost activities to share with the family and entertaining stories with the characters. OK, so that's our new materials for young learners. We also have a dedicated website. I'm just trying to move on to the next screen. Let's just see if I can get on to that one. OK, this is a dedicated website for those of you who are teaching young learners, and it's called World of Fun, as you can see there. Here you can find lots of resources and information about the Cambridge English qualifications for young learners. And this includes teaching tips, videos, articles, story videos, recordings of our webinars, creative drama activities, there's a booklet and videos, and writing booklets, which um, are very popular with teachers. And you can also view our full range of official preparation teach, um, materials for pre A1 starters, A1 movers and A2 flyers. So thank you for um, listening to um, our little um, interlude there. And I hope you've had time to have a think about your questions. I'm now going to hand back to Claire and we'll take a look um, see what you'd like to know okay claire um 
you spotted any questions there that you'd like to answer? Well, I think I think Jenny's answered um, Eleanor's question, which is the level of the books which were used. The, the actual, um, just so you know, the the images that were taken, the the pages that I used today were from Fun Skills One and Two, and I believe there was the text was obviously slightly higher level, and that was taken from Fun Skills Five. Okay. Um, oh, I have a question from Alexandra. Do you have any blogs to related to teaching? I don't currently have a blog. Um, I've been writing kind of like flat out now, I think for the last two and a half or three years on a number of different publications. Um, but this is something I'm definitely thinking about, particularly if I'm gonna have perhaps a little break from the writing, writing and taking um, more time to research and and give sessions like this. So, so I'll let you know. <laughs> um, yeah. And just to, just to say, Alexandra, we do have a Cambridge University Press blog which has um, a selection of articles on teaching young learners so when you get your email with the webinar recording we'll send you a link to that blog and then you can yeah. have a look around at other interesting yeah. posts for now yes in fact Alexandra I have written and it's and it's related to if you'd like to follow this up that I have written an article uh, that will be coming out in the world of fun shortly so it will be about this session. It will be about using visual literacy in the classroom. So, so do look out for that if you'd like to sort of follow up on this any further. Okay, we have. Da, 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 da. Can you ah? Can you introduce some books for implementation of life competencies in our classroom? Well, as far as I'm aware, this is from Elirisa. If that's if I pronounced it correctly, Alarisa. Um, I don't believe there's any concrete books on this. Um, we may find that there are um, chapters. We may find articles in certain books uh, in EELT on teaching life competences in the younger learners classroom. But this is very much a. I'm not going to say it's a. Um, it, it's, it's an expanding era, let's say, of the 21st century learning skills. So it may be that in certain books we'll find chapters on this, or in fact in magazines um, talking about uh, ELT methodology. Yeah, and and um, you will find Ali Reza. I mean, although we don't have books um, just about life competences, um, many of our um, materials here at Cambridge are now influenced by the Cambridge Framework of Life Competences. So you'll find these um, in Fun Skills, the course we just introduced, you'll find them in a course like Power Up, which is another primary course. So it's worth taking a look if that's an area that interests you um, at what materials we have and, and how life competencies are integrated into those courses. Okay. Okay, I can see another question from Mardi, which is, sorry, how can we make the learners more motivated in class by using pictures? I think part of this session was to look at how, um, as well, by using images that automatically um, motivate children. So by taking things like, we, we've looked at the imagery from using popular kind of, um, um, the kind of imagery they'll see on popular video games, things they see in their every life, everyday life outside of class, so making it very real for them. I think by selecting your pictures and images carefully, that will automatically motivate children as they can relate to it better. Um, is visual literacy helpful to develop all other language skills? We've got from Poonan. Uh, absolutely. Um, if you think about it through this, uh, there's listening, there could be dialogues, they can talk, uh, the children can agree or disagree about what they think about an image. Um, it can then perhaps trampoline to a writing. If we look at, for example, the room, they could write a description about their room or their favorite room. So I think there's, there's ample um, um, possibilities of developing all, all the skills in the classroom through visual literacy. How can we make the learners more, I think that's a similar question by using pictures. I think I've answered that one perhaps, Mardi. Can, can you recommend any online tools to create own image 
materials. I can I can um, recommend um, there are tools. There are also um, websites. I think one's photobabble.com. I think something like that, where actually children can create their own image and then talk about it. I think this is a case of exploring it. There is a lot out there, um, but that would be one that springs to mind right now. The photo photo babble. It's called. Um, let's have a look. How to control the interpretation in the class. Um, by this, are you thinking? I'm not sure if we know perhaps a class discussion. I think this would be use, just using your usual classroom techniques for turn taking, for example, to so they can offer their opinions in kind of a more of a methodical fashion. Um, any special guidebooks on teaching um, young learners? There are lots of books out there. Cambridge has books on teaching uh, teaching young learners, um, where there will be lots of useful sections as well on not just visual literacy, but on teaching writing and learning te learning um, techniques, for example. Um, <laughs> What else do we have here? The recording, Jenny. Could you answer that question? Yes, you will all, if you've been in attendance on the webinar, and even people who've registered and not been able to attend, um, you will be sent the recording of this webinar. So you'll be able to catch up and share mm -hmm. it with friends as well and other colleagues and teachers. OK, thank you. Um, there's okay. another question from Ross, which is how can we encourage how can we encourage our students to think about imagery independently outside class? I think part of the session today is to um, provide them with these tools. Um, so, so if we are uh, automatically in our classes, always thinking about getting the children to understand, to make opinions about it. Um, to decide whether they think this is a real image or not, is it a fake? I think that then we are providing them with the tools to think more independently outside. That would be my my answer to that question, Ross. Okay. I think are there any more questions? Okay, let's just see. There's one um, from Ed what is what is the difference, Edgardo, of this fun skills book to the other Cambridge lear young learners books? Um, pri primarily, it's a skills based book, so we have other supplementary materials for young learners, such as fun for starters, movers and flyers, which again it sits alongside another course. Um, we have story fun, which is more story based. Um, Fun skills is quite a thorough preparation. As you can see, there are two books per exam level and it does focus on the skills very thoroughly. Um, there are lots of characters in it. Um, my advice to you would be to take a look at them, um, ask for samples from our representatives and see which one fits with your requires requirements better. Um, they've got different numbers of hours as well, so it depends how much time you have have. Um, I see another question here. Can you advise a modern course book for flyers between 10 to 13 year olds? Again, it depends whether you're looking for a, um, a core course book or a supplementary. Um, we do have fun for flyers. Um, we have also story fun levels five and six would be suitable for flyers. Fun skills levels five and six. Um, if you're looking for a core course book, then the relevant levels of a course such as Kids Box or Power Up might also work for you. So again, I'd I'd speak to a Cambridge representative and ask for some samples and see which is going to fit with your situation the best. Oh yes, you're saying core. So yes, I take a look at Kids mm. Box or Power Up for those purposes. Okay, um, I th I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. Um, but thank you all for coming. Don't forget to check our events page for details of upcoming webinars, which you can visit at cambridge.org/elt-events. 
And just to let you know, next week on the 12th and 13th of March, we have David Valence talking about upskilling our young learners. That's another um, webinar which might interest you all. And the following week, the week after that, on the 19th and 20th of March, we have Monty Watkin on phonics for young learners. It's called Sounds Fun, Looks Right. And you can register for all of those webinars in the same place as you have for this one. As we've mentioned before, the recording of today's webinar should be live on our blog and on YouTube next week. You will all be emailed your attendance certificates along with a link to the recording. So thank you all so much for attending. We really hope you've enjoyed it and we hope to see you again sometime. Thank you.